Spain's Prime Minister made a visit to Morocco this week. His government has agreed to support Rabat's plans to grant autonomy to the disputed Western Sahara Territory. But will this change in policy from Madrid make a difference? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Spain and Morocco have been at odds for many years. They disagreed over territories, immigration and support for rebels in the region. But a visit by the Spanish Prime Minister to Rabat this week is raising hopes of improved ties. The two sides have agreed to put aside their differences and expand economic cooperation. They signed more than 20 trade and investment agreements on Thursday, promising to work together and uphold a policy of what they called mutual respect. The summit in the capital marks their first high-level meeting since 2015, and it comes less than a year since Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez backed Morocco's plan to grant autonomy to the disputed Western Sahara Territory. The Polisario separatist group, which wants an independent state in the region, has rejected that plan. Well, this dispute goes back to 1975. That's when the former Spanish colony of Western Sahara was annexed by Morocco. It sparked an armed conflict between Rabat and the Polisario Front. In 1991, the UN stepped in. It brokered a ceasefire with a promise of a referendum on independence. That has yet to take place. Sixteen years later, Morocco introduced its Western Sahara Autonomy Plan to the UN. It was rejected by the Polisario, maintaining its support for a referendum on independence. Morocco got a big diplomatic push in 2020, when then-US President Donald Trump recognised its sovereignty over the disputed territory. Since then, Rabat has been trying to gain more international support, particularly across Europe. Well, let's go now to our guests. And joining us from London is Hugh Lovett, a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. In Kuwait City is Moroccan professor Yasmin Hasnawi, who teaches political science at the American International University in Kuwait. And in Brussels is Majoub Meha, advocacy at the head of the Collective Aus of Sahwari and Human Rights Defenders. A very warm welcome to all of you. Hugh, why has Spain reversed five decades of neutrality to back Morocco's autonomy plan in the Western Sahara? Uh, well, first and foremost, this is about Spain trying to restore and improve its relations with Morocco. Over the past few years, I think it's fair to say they've been in a pretty rocky relationship um, over a number of issues. But you know, at the heart of this is clearly the Western Sahara conflict. But for Spain, you know. Um, uh, inability to coordinate uh, um, immigration control or migration control with Morocco was another key factor. So there's a lot of reasons that uh, Spain felt that there was a need to restore this, uh, this relationship with uh, Morocco. And ultimately, the price for restoring that uh, was a change in Spain's position towards uh, Western Sahara and to align itself with uh, Morocco's positioning. It's an interesting move, isn't it? Because it's not even supported by most Spaniards. Indeed. And, and I think the way that the Spanish government did it, um, from my point of view, at least as someone who works on European foreign policy, was very problematic in terms of the lack of consultation with um, Spanish parties, as you said, but also by all indications, a lack of consult consultation from, um, from within the ministries, the foreign ministry itself. And so this was very much a political decision that was taken at a political level for uh, political reasons, namely that uh, restoring the bilateral relationship. Now, it was uh, now a pretext for this that the Spanish government tried to use was this would actually also help peace. Um, but I think and we'll have the chance to talk about this. Uh, when you look at events on the ground, that does not seem to be the case. Mm, absolutely. OK, Matt let's get to your reactions to Spain's move, a political decision. But what are the ramifications for the people in Western Sahara? Well, this is this is a position taken uh, by Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain, which was uh, rejected by overwhelming majority in the, in the Parliament, and even even with his uh, within his own political party. Um, this visit, for instance, um, his his um, vice president refused to join him for this visit due to the controversiality of the position. 
taken by Seychelles towards the question of Western Sahara in, 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 in violation of breaking the, the, the consistent uh, consensus position of Spain during during decades, uh, especially especially when we know that Spain is responsible for Western Sahara, historically responsible for the decolonization or not completing the decolonization process uh, in, in Western Sahara and, and legally responsible as it is and remains the administering power in, in the occupied territories of Western Sahara, a capability that cannot be transferred into international law. From 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 Sahrawi perspective, uh, uh, the the history repeats itself, and the, the Spanish betrayal to the Sahrawi people uh, reproduces itself, uh, and 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 basically, uh, the Sahrawi people uh, uh, calling for 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 Spain to resume its responsibility and allow the people of Western Sahara to freely express and decide or choose their political future uh, under under the UN supervision. Mm -hmm. Um, the autonomy plan that was proposed by Morocco, uh, and I'm quite sure that no one who, who claimed to support it knows what it is actually in fact. No one knows uh, what are the details of such a, uh, an autonomy plan, nor the constitution or the regime nature in Morocco allows or can accommodate such such a proposal. Okay, it well, let's just give Yasmina a chance of, of, to jump in there, because clearly, Yasmin, Morocco has welcomed this support from Spain. But what difference does it actually make on the ground? As Majoub says, what actually is the autonomy plan that has now got Spain's backing? And is it going to allow it to move forward at all? I mean, give us an idea of what we're talking about here. Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about Spain and why Spain has decided to make the move. First of all, within the international law at the Security Council, uh, many uh, the the members of the Security Council have endorsed the autonomy plan. So I don't think that they don't know what's inside the autonomy plan. Okay, well, just, just tell us for the sake the of our viewers, because we, we don't know what's inside the autonomy I, plan. So do, do tell okay. us. So autonomy plan is to propose to give the uh, judicial administrative management to the Sahara and the Sahrawi population and the, the Moroccan sovereignty and the uh, the uh, uh, it was it was crystal crystal clear and the uh, uh, there were like many resolutions that endorsed the autonomy plan uh, the the powers like the United States Spain Germany and the members of the Security Councils in, endorsed the autonomy plan now I think that uh, Spain uh, understood well where its interests lies and made Made sure that Morocco is a strategic partner and decided to actually leave uh, this Cold War ideology behind by working with Morocco and deciding because they know everyone knows that the, this dispute is not between the Polisario. It's between Algeria and and Morocco and the and the proof is that Algeria was cited in more than 30 resolutions five times at the UN resolution and more than 89% of the UN member states endorsed the autonomy the autonomy plan now i think that uh, what is happening now in the world is that Morocco is gaining a momentum, not only at the Security Council, but at the level of the African Union and at the level of uh, the European Union. We have seen that at the European Union, uh, the, its recent report, the, the 2022 report, uh, actually hailed uh, Morocco in um, actually uh, in, its, in, 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 in uh, using actually the resources for the benefits of the Sahrawi population. Okay. So I'm not let's, talking let's, uh, about Let's bring in Hugh there. So I just want to see if he agrees with that. Does Spain's backing, does it signify a momentum that Morocco is building for its support for this autonomy plan, for giving uh, the Sahwaris the right to rule, but under Morocco's sovereignty? That seems to be the key issue of this autonomy plan. Is that something that the European Union is supporting, that you're seeing other countries getting behind? Mm. Clearly, there is growing support for Morocco's autonomy plan. I think that's undeniable. Um, what Spain did, though, was actually come out even more strongly in support of it. So up until then, um, most uh, members of the UN, UN Security Council, had said that, yes, it was a, uh, a good basis for negotiations, but never said it was the only basis. Mm. I think this is quite important because while there is this growing support for the autonomy plan, uh, uh, members of the UN Security Council, uh, of the European Union, 
also quite clear that any it has to be an agreement that's acceptable to both sides. It has to be a negotiated agreement. And I think this is the problem, because ultimately uh, the Polisario and the Sahrawi people will not accept um, Morocco's autonomy plan. And so, yes, you can come out and support it if you're European or if you're the US, but that doesn't really get you that far in, in negotiations with the Polisario, because the way I see it, it's basically, you know, it leads you down a dead end because it's not acceptable. So my point of view is how can you actually, you know, try to bridge the, the, the gap between Morocco's proposal and also um, the Polisario's proposal, which it put forward in 2007 at the same time. Well, so Matthew Blitz, let's ask you that question. How is the gap bridged between the autonomy plan and the Polisario's demands? Well, actually, there is only one gap, and, and, and that is of accepting um, to, to freely allow the Sahrawi people to choose, and, and as, as, as the Polisario say, to include that as an option. But the, the, the final uh, call should be the, the Sahrawi people's call, and the decision should be taken freely by the Sahrawis. But to, to come back to, to the autonomy plan, which, which remains unclear, of course, to everyone. And, and we have seen how Donald Trump, before leaving office, declared, declared its support to it. And now the same happening with Sanchez as we are now in, in an election year in, in Spain. And this position was, was, was widely rejected by, by Spanish political parties and by the Spanish people. Uh, to 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 come to 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 a conclusion, any position that goes in contradiction with the international law as it applies to Western Sahara will contribute only to intensifying or or increasing the the suffer in the territory, destabilizing the region and the entire entire uh, people of it. Uh, let us be clear here that that Western Sahara. And, and the position of the Spanish position is outside the common policy of the EU, as we have seen Borrell's uh, uh, declaration of Rabat that remains supportive to the UN process. In the same time, uh, we, we, we should not ignore the, 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 the EU law and the decisions made by the highest court of justice in the EU that came with three main conclusions. Western Sahara and Morocco are separate and distinct territories, Morocco has no sovereignty over Western Sahara, and the trade deals between the EU and Morocco cannot be legal without obtaining the consent of the Sahara people. And if that applies on the plunder of natural resources of Western Sahara, I think that pretty much applies to when it comes to the decision of the political future of the people of Western okay, Sahara. So, so that, so that is the stance. Context, I, I understand that that is the, the stance of the Polisario, but given the reality on the ground, we're seeing Morocco making these diplomatic advances. So what's the Polisario's response to that? How, does it, how will it counter it or offer an alternative? Well, exactly. That's that's a major question that the Polisario has to deal with. And we have seen, uh, we have followed the last, latest Congress of the Polisario uh, a couple of weeks ago, where uh, first time the Polisario had two candidates for, for the presidency of the Sahara Republic and the Polisario Front. Um, it, it went, of course, in, in, in a very new atmosphere. Uh, but at the end, uh, it's a good experience that we have experienced in, 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 in at the Sadr or the Polisario level. On the other side, what Polisario can offer is, is basically uh, what, what the UN has proposed, is engaging in, in a serious political talks that put, uh, uh, put a clear roadmap uh, with a determined uh, deadline for the comp uh, implementation of the political process and, and the referendum in Western Sahara. Uh, the, we have seen that Morocco tries to win time that, that only contributed to breaking the ceasefire, uh, annexing extra territories, and now we have the war ongoing again in, in Western Sahara after being silent for, for 30 years of, of the peace process. This comes, of course, is as a result of the failure of the international community, mainly the Security Council, in implementing its own resolutions. Uh, a promised referendum in 30 years that could not be implemented. I think the Sahrawis are not to be blamed for, for, for waiting that long, nor for, for having, having, having uh, or getting fed up of the 
of the of the way the UN deals with the processing with Sahara. Okay. In yes, general, me, yes, me. I want to just uh, bring you back in here because it, it does seem very clear that the Polisario is, is not going to accept this autonomy plan and therefore is not the only way forward to give the people of Western Sahara the right to choose their own future. Well, actually, when talking about the representativity here, uh, I think that all the time they, we are mentioning, they are mentioning the, uh, the, some are mentioning that the representative of this issue are the people who live in Tinduf camps. How about the, the people who live in the Moroccan Western Sahara? Mm. The population, there is more than 80% of the Sahrawis who live in the Western Sahara, in the Moroccan Western Sahara, they actually, they enjoy, uh, the they, 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 they participate in the economic, social, political level. So actually they gave their word. They wanted to be part of, of Morocco. So the, it was, it was clear cut. And that's why we have seen that the United Nations decided to bury the referendum as, as it doesn't go in line with the aspiration of the Sahrawis. Okay, High just a second, UN Yasmin, because I can see you've, you've raised a number of points there that I can see yeah. Hugh is, is disagreeing no, with. I, I just want him I to, give, to have a chance. That because the, the, the representativity no, I mean, like, is important. So okay. uh, let's, let's just let Hugh respond to that and then can come back to you in a moment. Now, when you look at the history of the UN-backed uh, peace process and UN Security Council deliberations and UN General Assembly resolutions, uh, the people who, are, who have to decide are the people of Western Sahara. Uh, whether they live in Western Sahara or in Tinduf, it's the Sahrawis who have to decide. And during the 1990s and early 2000s, there was quite a, a determined and serious process to register Sahrawis to be able to participate uh, in a future uh, referendum under UN auspices. So I think we need to be very clear, this is not about those who reside in Western Sahara, it's about the people of Western Sahara, which is a very clear uh, term under international law. So it's these people that will have to decide. And, and this was the, the subject of uh, okay. past negotiations between the Polisario and Morocco, it was something Morocco itself recognised. Absolutely. OK, so people in the Western Sahara region and the refugees living in camps in Algeria. Yes. Is it not the case, Yasmin, that Morocco quite simply has failed to win the hearts and minds of all of these people? And that's why we're in the predicament that it's in today. Well, I don't think that uh, uh, Morocco, uh, it's important also, I don't think that Morocco, I'm sure that Morocco has not failed to win the hearts of the Sahrawis. Uh, more than 80% of the local populations, the Sahrawis, live under the Moroccan sovereignty. They propose, they vote, they are members of the political parties, they participate. So I think, uh, whereas in, in, in few kilometers from the Western Sahara, the refugees camps in Tindufs, we are we are seeing, we are hearing that there is a real dire, you know, humanitarian conditions that persist for, for many decades. People, young people are incar incarcerated in the Tinduf prison, prisons. Those actually in Tinduf camps who endorse or are or endorse the autonomy plan are imprisoned. So winning the hearts of the Sahrawis, we can see it in in the Western Sahara, in the Moroccan Western Sahara, with the people who are actually enrolled in the in the in the Spanish census. So um, I, I don't go online with those who say that people has not uh, uh, that Morocco has not won the hearts of the Sahrawis because one has to go to uh, to to Morocco to Western Sahara okay. and see with their own eyes. How, okay. how Ma the Sahrawis Ma live. Perhaps you could give us an idea as well from your perspective what life is like in Western Sahara for the people who live there and indeed for people in the camps in Tindouf. Well, indeed, the, the people of Western Sahara has been forced to live separate um, because there is a separation wall with uh, millions of landmines that separate the territory to uh, west and east of the berm or the separation wall. Um, people living in the liberated territories or the refugee camps and, of course, the Sahrawis living under the occupied territories. And referring to the population and the people, those are two different terms, of course, uh, uh, when it comes to demographic engineering and demographic transfer, especially knowing Morocco has been sending thousands, hundreds of thousands of settlers into the territory for decades of its occupation that has made the Sahrawis minority in, in the occupied territories and occupied cities. 
uh, uh, back in relation to the autonomy plan, if Russia now, and, and here it comes, here where, where I think that the EU and, and the US and all the West that claims to defend the international law are a very, very difficult spot here when they claim defend the international law. Would they accept an autonomy plan proposed by Russia for Donbass or Donetsk or Crimea? that occupies right now. It will not be the case. And defending international law should be everywhere and all the time. And when it comes to Western Sahara, the case is not really different. It is a military hostile occupation that that is ongoing for decades and, and must be must be must be aimed at. Morocco denies uh, uh, being an occupying power in Western Sahara. And here here starts the, the, the first mistake and negotiating on giving an autonomy plan, we should go back first to define in which capacity you can provide or propose a, an autonomy plan. You have no legal standing in Western Sahara to make such a proposal. So uh, for for the Sahrawis, of course, uh, when it comes to human rights situation uh, in the camps, I'm not claiming that it is rose and 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 very good situation. But what I know, being part of of a human rights organization active in the occupied territories of Western Sahara, that I know that there are major strategies imposed on the Sahrawis, starting from forced allegiance imposed on the people in order to access bread or to access the fish, their own natural resources, they have to swear allegiance to the Moroccan occupation. Okay. We have the demographic okay. engineering Let's bring and in Yasmin again, seen, because I, I'm pretty sure she's got some, under, some comments to respond to all of that. If, uh, first of all, Yasmin, there's this comparison uh, between course, the Western Sahara and Ukraine. It comes up quite a lot by people uh, in support of the Polisario. Do, do you think it's a fair comparison? Well, no, it's totally different. Again, uh, the you know the the Western Sahara, uh, the 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 occupation of the Western Moroccan Western Sahara did not start in 1975 or even before the creation of the of the Polisario. It started in 1830 by England, by France, by, by sorry, by Spain. Mm -hmm. And then the creation of the Polisario came way after that. So we have to actually. It's important to go back to the to the to the history. And then Algeria came in during the second president, Hawari Boumedien, that decided to counter Morocco in every step because of psychological, historical, geographical reasons. One has to go back to the history. Now we are seeing that back into into uh, into the back in the past in 1895, UK said in clear cut that the territory of Western Sahara belonged to Morocco. Let's go back okay, to the... Okay, let's, to the, let's, uh, let's not go too far back into the history. We've only got five saying, minutes you know, left. And I'd like to look forward... 89% of the people of the UN, the members of the Security Council, they call for a political solution that is aligned with the uh, the, the plan of autonomy. Okay. The, the referendum is a by one because it doesn't answer the aspiration. It does not go in line with the aspiration of the Sahrawi people. Again, the representativity, we're not talking about the representativity of the Sahrawis in Tindouf. We have also to look at the representativity of the Sahrawis who live in uh, in, in, in Moroccan Western Sahara, of course, the Sahrawis, and I go in line with the guest of, from, from London that says that the Sahrawis who are enrolled in the Spanish census. So let's okay. make things clear and go to the, to the history again. This is, Hugh, because this is very important. Hugh, where is the UN the in all of this? Because it is saying it is a disputed region. It's not falling on one side or the other. It's dropped this plan for a referendum. What more does it need to be doing? Well, first, I think I should clarify, the UN has not dropped the plan for the referendum. But it's dead in the um, water. No the one's even talking not, about it anymore. That, well, it hasn't dropped it. I think it's clear that it's, in these current conditions, almost impossible to hold for a variety of reasons. We're in a conflict again. Uh, but also, we need to recognise that it is Morocco, historically, that has actually blocked that. And I'd say, um, for our Moroccan guest, if Morocco is so certain about um, the, the points of view of the Sahrawi people, then it should allow a referendum to be held to be able to, to confirm that. Um, and I'd also have to push back and say the UN has never said that Morocco's autonomy plan is the only way that this conflict should be resolved. Through. Um, so how do we move forward? Um, clearly, you know, we're in a war, so there will have to be a degree of uh, de-escalation and confidence building. Um, but my own advice, if I was to give it, 
would be to actually you know look back at what happened uh, in the early 2000s when the uh, the then uh, UN uh, personal envoy actually proposed uh, his own bridging proposal. So trying to, to work with, to consult with, uh, with Morocco, but also the Polisario, and to try to determine what would be a, a mutually acceptable framework. But I think crucially, whatever, uh, whatever the UN would come up with, it would need to be put to a referendum. Mm. Because ultimately, from the US point of view, what this is about is ensuring decolonization of Western Sahara. This is how it all started, but also ensuring the right to self-determination of the people of Western Sahara. And this right can be fulfilled through a variety of means, potentially through in, uh, incorporation to Marco, potentially through independence, or potentially through a third way, um, what I would call free association between, uh, between Western Sahara and Marco, kind of a way that, that tries to, to share powers, uh, that tries to advance power sharing and sharing of sovereignty. So, Hugh, can any of that be uh, be, admit, be met, be, be achieved if Morocco and Algeria don't see eye to eye on this issue? I think clearly that's a, a complicating factor, but I think we should be also clear that this is a conflict between the Polisario and Morocco, not between right. Morocco and Algeria in this particular case. But what I'd also add is I think the international community, especially the European Union and the US, have an important role to play because unless they're actually prepared to bring to bear their own leverage over the parties, um, the UN will not be able to move forward in the current conditions. OK, there we're going to have to leave our discussion today. I thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Hugh Lovett, Yasmin Hasnoui and Machub Mleha. And thank you, too, very much for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.